and welcome to A Piece of String, the show that brings together comedians and scientific minds to ask and maybe answer the biggest of all questions ever. I'm Matthew Shrubman, I'm a chemist and biophysicist by training, and with me today are Josie Peters, an astrophysicist. Hello. Frank Grimes, a biochemist. Al Reed. And James Wells, an engineer. How do we do? And that's everyone. So Josie, what's your question today? My question is, can soap get dirty? Great question. So I think, so I'm going to go straight in here. Isn't it sodium stearate? And I think it works. Whoa, that's technical. I Hello. think it works. I think it works by capturing the dirt within the complex large molecule. I was going to go in with something much less technical, which was like, I treat soap like I treat towels. I finish using them when I'm clean, so they stay clean. That's the thing that people do. No, oh, just me. Is it original? Just me. Is what gets wetter as it dries? It's a towel. It is a towel. It's a towel. It is a towel. Everyone oh, that yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. So does soap get dirty just over time or, or as you use it to clean things? Or? As, as user over time. So I've got one that I think might be a little bit dirty. There is bits of dust in it that I just can't get rid of. Do you fear it? Constantly. I'm to look menacingly at my bathroom as I pass it. Okay. We've got some steps <laughs> that you can take. Yeah. I'm wondering about the tipping point as well. But like, you know the soap's dirty, but you're dirtier than the soap. Ooh. So do you, like, what, what's that Relative tipping point thing. where you're like, I don't care how dirty that soap is, I'm dirtier. Now to wash. How do, you, how do you define clean is another thing, right? How, how is it clean? Because is... If the dirt is in the soap, is the dirt clean? Or is the soap dirty? I've just realised the answer. I've realised the answer, which is, is there ever a bar of soap that you wouldn't want to use because it's been used by someone else in a certain location upon them? Think, think of your own scenario. And if the answer is yes, then yes, soap can become dirty. That is a great I would answer. But also, I'd shave use a bar of soap, though. As in, if, as in grow, if it was a my grow. imaginary or not so imaginary person, I would not like to use the soap after. I would use it given something to like remove yes. the, just yeah, the, the epidermis of the soap. Just Soap is good, isn't it? Like we've had it for quite a while. Like morally good? Yeah, it's good at doing what it does. And I mean, it is great. Like obviously if hospitals are really good at using soap, they don't get many hospital-based infections. But he, there is better stuff. Like um, a friend of mine invented this stuff and they were using it in um in hospitals and every hospital they trialed it in they found that they got zero hospital based infections for the whole year what so that's that, wicked. that i would say is better than soap better than soap what's it is it a liquid what is it? a solid a gas i don't know if i'm allowed to say what it is oh of course I can. it's called biotrol it's good stuff anyway um yeah <laughs> yeah so <laughs> that in there. Slip it in. <laughs> i'm not at all in commission i do think it's cool i think it's cool like, how it works do you anyway. use it like a soap or is it like you use an antibac it's you use it a bit like an antibacterial oh, thing because yeah. I, I saw a thing once where it was like oh the goodness of hand washing is the fact that you are physically removing the bacteria whereas like antibacterial like the the stuff that you can carry in your handbag or wherever else is slightly less effective because you're, you're rubbing in this stuff that tries to kill things, but you're not actually physically washing it away. Ah, uh, this sort of acts as both, I guess. But I'm going to stop advertising this product that I have now. <laughs> that has nothing to do with me. Um, Can I interject with a personal question? Please. Do people use soap as the bar, or are you people who use, like, you know, like a shower poofy, I believe they're called in technical spheres? Uh, just a poofy. <laughs> a poofy. <laughs> it's made even more ridiculous by the Geordie accent. A poofy. Use a shower poofy. Bless you. Um, yeah. I've got my own methods, cute. which are separate to both of those. Is there anyone else? One in each hand. No. What? Half time. No. Multiple soaps. Yeah. I'm bar to skin. Mm. So, one soap bar, one wall puff. is what I go for. So I have several strapped up against the wall and then I <laughs> myself against that. <laughs> the cool thing about soap is that it's all surfactants, right? Which mm. is the same kind of stuff that our cells are made of. Mm. So I, I mean, this is, uh, this is one of the things I was, I was thinking before about soap is that it, it's quite good at disrupting cell membranes, I think, and that's one of the reasons why it's good at actually killing bacteria. Is that right? That is correct. So that means soap on an open wound is bad? Uh, they are all, my understanding, though rusty from degree times, is that all cell membranes are essentially some form of like lipid type structure, which is what the surfactant mm. acts against. Um, surfactant being the chemical in the soap? Yes. Uh, and I would 
I would strongly think that you might get some disruption to your own cells at some level if you're using soap on an open wound. However, that versus infection is kind of, and like the concentration of them, of the chemicals in the soap might be quite low. So it's enough to kill or disrupt a bacterial membrane, but diluted on human skin, maybe not. I don't know. Please don't stop washing your wounds as a result of this, by the way. Mm. Do as your doctors tell you. Always a good advice. Long live the NHS. <laughs> so I actually looked up an answer to this, uh, put a bit of time into it, really, you know, got my head down. And uh, ultimately, James just issued the answer immediately as soon as we began this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Always perfectly. Um, <laughs> with no preparation at all. Great way, James. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so basically the, the soap... Sorry, I'm really sorry. <laughs> I'm really sorry about that. That's right. Uh, yeah, so the soap particles... Um, the soap itself gets dirty, but then the physical act of rubbing the soap against the skin removes the dirty soap from the soap leaving a clean layer beneath sort of like a rubber now the rubber mm. sort of except the rubber gets encased in graphite from the pencil whereas this way around the yeah. soap encases the dirt the and then is rubbed away but then every good school kid knows to clean your rubber you rub on the desk so you rub off all of their little kernels although now they've got these sweet pens called f- the friction pens that, oh um, yeah they raise them so do you guys know about these What's no, yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah, no yeah. I, I'm behind on stationary there are these cool new pens that you can I mean they're not that new now but you, you can you can erase by um, just rubbing out the pen with this special rubber and ultimately it works because it gets hot and the chemical changes to something transparent and this is why you're not allowed to use these pens in exams because when they scan them with infrared photocopiers mm-hmm. the pen vanishes because oh. it's heating it up and so the so the, the examiners will see the exam and it's like well they've not they've not read anything but if you put the exam papers into the freezer then the ink will turn back to its original color and then you can see it again brilliant that's a good excuse for I didn't do my homework. Yes, you did, but you just didn't put it in the freezer yet or mm. such like. I don't know how. <laughs> I, think I, I think I got the conversation the wrong way. <laughs> that's, like, that's like beyond nerd. You've, like, you've done your homework, but you, but you know it's really good. So you, you, don't want to hand it, you don't want to hand it in and show everyone up. So you're like, you heat it up. <laughs> hand it in blank. Oh, I'm so... <laughs> I like that. Oh, I like a secret note system. I like that as well. Just carrying around small heaters and freezers in your pockets so that you can have secret code with your friends. (laughs) (laughs) You shouldn't have said that live on here. Yeah, this is going to come on the market. Okay, I have a another question here. Um, <clears throat> when a gecko sheds its tail under siege, 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 siege. You're always doing it wrong. From ants, etc. How does it feel to remove its tail? How does it feel for you, James? Yeah, average. Just above average, actually. <laughs> Me. But I, 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 wonder, I wonder what it feels like because, you know, we, we can't... There are a lot of animals that can just detach a limb to, to protect themselves, right? Spider crabs? Apparently they grow them back. Mm. A spider can lose... Like, an actual spider can lose a leg and grow a leg, can't mm. it? Maybe that's why they call it a spider crab. Can it regrow ah. the leg, a spider? I'm sure I've heard of that before. And isn't it when you cut a worm in half, doesn't it oh, become two is, worms? That or is, is that a lie? That is a lie. Oh. That is a lie. That's a really good lie. Uh, is, there, is it There's, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Really? The, wor- the worm needs both ends and ultimately the worm will die. That's really, really? sorry. Yeah, well, People so should tell small children that. They cut them a lot. You can, I think, you can cut a worm in half and it survive if and only if you've grown it. It's, it only if it grew in anti-gravity. Uh, not all, zero gravity, sorry, to begin with. Because in its embryology, I don't know if you call it an embryo with a worm, presume you do, um, it, without gravity, it grows in a weird way where it grows two heads and two tails. Hmm. And then you can cut it in half. Yeah. I watched an hour-long program on this and they were saying how it was, uh, it was like... <laughs> okay, it, I'm wrong. It was almost like, uh, like a... It, you know, they could live forever, hmm. in theory. I think as well, does it depend also, which immortal, way you cut immortal, it? Because we're, we're assuming that you would cut it uh, perpendicular to the long end, right? So you're God, cutting the, the short... Slicing it down its head. How <laughs> if cruel you do it are you? Long... <laughs> <laughs> Peeling it open like a banana. Yeah. Disgusting. 
<laughs> but we were, um, it was it was geckos, wasn't it? To begin with, it was. Oh, yes, yeah, so yeah. I <laughs> my imagining of the gecko losing its tail would be similar to you know where you're you're about to miss your train and you don't get a chance to go and buy a sandwich first. It's like you get like the satisfying feeling of like I made the train just oh, but you like kind of lament over the loss of the possible sandwich. Yes, yeah. I got away, got away. but yeah, oh, yeah. shame! I got to go to the tail. But what would it be like for us? Is it like getting a haircut or something? Clipping your nails? No. What's the Though human equivalent? Though I do equivalent? feel anxious when those things happen. I get to think of a human equivalent and all I can think of is haircuts and trimming the old nails. Can I just very, very quickly bring this back to the off-topic uh, situation of, of the worm being cut in half? I, I, have, I have just looked it up. So, so near the front of the worm, there's this bulge called the clitellum. Um, and if you cut a worm behind that, then it might regrow its tail. The head might regrow its tail and survive, maybe. But the tail will definitely die. Uh, so you don't get two worms. Don't get two worms. You don't, you don't necessarily get a dead worm. So the hour-long program... I'm going to be calling some people. <laughs> <laughs> I, sh- I should never have made it. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, did anyone, did anyone get an answer? Yes, I, I had a look. My initial thought, I initially went for emotional feelings. Um, and it's basically when you are sufficiently stressed, which I quite like as a concept. Um, and the whole thing is called autotomy, which is, comes from the Greek for self-amputation. Uh, so it can happen when a gecko is threatened, it's ill, it's being bullied by other geckos. Oh, Stress, fear, or just getting stuck which I suppose is a stressful situation. Uh, so it's very much a defence mechanism. But in terms of how it might feel physically, what happens is because they are adapted to do this, the blood vessels constrict to the tail. And so, and there is also a, a place that's kind of a weak spot where this is meant to happen. Mm-hmm. And so it will just drop off and very little blood loss will occur. Um, the gecko might probably be a bit sad. It affects its balance. Mm-hmm. And also if it's got the chance, it might go back and eat the tail because it stores a lot of fat deposits in there. Oh, and the new sick. tail that's grown back will be a slightly different colour. It won't be, might not be as pointy as the one that it had before as well but in terms of how it f- feels probably not too painful because it's it it's made it, you know it's meant to be able to do that so oh, it's cool that it eats its tail mm. do you think they tell stories about it like oh mate how do you get that such rounded tail <laughs> Maybe. you it's different will never to, believe different colour to the rest of your body what happened um, so the, the thing about cutting off the blood supply this reminded me of that thing you know about amputations where they used to just put a tourniquet around it to cut off the blood supply and then they'd, then they'd amputate and it took hundreds of years to realise that actually if you just leave the tourniquet on for a few hours before you amputate then there's no feeling in the limb my legs are going all funny under the table <laughs> oh. mm. does the legs still that. wiggle away as a gecko's tail does apparently when the ge- apparently when the tail falls off to distract whoever is trying to catch the Whoa. gecko the, the tail will continue to wiggle around geckos are well cool yeah but in the time of uh, Florence Nightingale and that sort of Scenario. And Mary Seacole, um, never what, forget. What percentage of amputees do you think would survive on the battlefield? On the battle, as in they've been amputated you know, they, and then... They've been taken to a safe haven and then amputated the uh, relevant limb. That's an important Whoa, point. Whoa, I reckon like five. <laughs> the wrong limb. I, know this, I, know, I only know this roughly, we need to check it out. But five I think 11%. 11%. Whoa, niche. But survive? Yeah. I reckon it's surprisingly high, maybe 43%. I'm told it's around the 80% mark. Whoa. It's incredibly effective as long as you can stop the bleeding afterwards. Even so with infection maybe. rates. It's fantastic stuff. Don't That's do it if you've got a common cold, though. Not worth it. Cool. And now for the mystery midsection. Okay, so just before we started the show, I gave everyone the following question. Why don't pregnant women fall over forwards? And then I asked everyone to write down a fictional but reasonable sounding answer. And I will now read out all of those answers with the real answer mixed in. Everyone will then get a chance to decide which answer they think is right. And points will be allocated on a secret and arbitrary basis by me. And the winner will get this freshly boiled egg that I am holding. Here goes. When a pregnant mother falls, she will roll onto her back due to the lower density of the baby compared with the mother. Personally, I don't think that one makes any sense. Unless it's the truth. Correct. Mm. 
<laughs> Answer number two. The fluid in the woman's stomach acts like a spirit level. Answer number three. The bones in a woman's spine are shaped like cheese wedges, which means that they bend outwards to curve around the baby. Answer number four. During pregnancy, the distribution of fat adjusts such that it moves more towards the buttocks and the thighs, which in part counterbalances the forward's weight. And answer number five. During pregnancy, women get bigger feet. The increased foot mass and cankle water provides general ballast and increased steadiness in the face of strong breezes, etc. So, which answer do you think was correct and why? Go see. I'm intrigued by the feet one. Because yeah. I, I imagine that a woman's feet might change in size, that they might swell up a bit, get a bit bigger. Do you get maternity shoes? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point, actually. Maybe not. No, you just don't leave the house. But maybe the distribution of, of fats... Is that is that good? Maybe a, yeah. Balance seems like a like a good one. Okay. Um, that's I would lean towards. Lean towards. Got hey. it. Or lean lean backwards. From, but also <laughs> towards the From answer. From the ground. <laughs> <laughs> the <other way. laughs> okay, Fran. What about what about you? What do you, what do you think? Uh, my my gut went with the spirit level thing because when you when you first posed the question, my immediate thought was spirit level. Um, but then the more I thought about it, that didn't make too much sense because the spirit level can still fall. Um, I believe. So I'm going to go with, I think I'll go with back cheese. <laughs> the, back, the cheese the wedge. medical condition. Yeah. The cheese wedge shaped spine. Mm. James? Well, I was going to say that I like the idea of the fat going to the buttocks and the thighs, but it doesn't really sound quite right, does it? Um, well, hang on now, James. Yeah. <laughs> um, that is the one that I'm going to go for. Yeah, it's the fat redistribution of fat. You aren't going to go for that one. Yeah, but you just you said you weren't. No, no, I said I I was. <laughs> Sounds like a man who's not sure. <laughs> no, no, I, I I said I was going to say that I like the idea of the fat going to their buttocks, but it just sounds incorrect. Okay, well, I'll I'll reveal the answer, but first I will reveal that the winner was me, because I came up with the one amount redistribution of fat, which may or may not be the case, but. Not, not the answer I found when I was doing my research. The answer is the uh, cheese wedge answer. Uh, Women's nice. spines uh, in the lower region are shaped slightly differently to men's, such that they're slightly cheese wedge shaped so that they can curve around the baby, adjusting the support of the female further backwards, such that the baby can sit further backwards so they're not leaning over forwards too much. Crumbs. I'm feeling that pretty <laughs> smug. Yeah, Fran, oh, that Fran, was a solid second. That was solid the one second. that I was like <laughs> solidly sure was not going to be true. Like, why would you have a cheese wedge back? Crumbs. I'm just completely flabbergasted. I'm going to keep saying crumbs all over again. Wow. That's a piece of string for you. Must be string. Question from Fran. What if? The seas were in salty. Mm. I wonder. Yes. Let's all wonder together. You wouldn't get that sting when you go in with a cut in the water, would you? Mm. The fish wouldn't need to come to the surface to drink when it rains. Is that a Is thing? That true? <laughs> no. <laughs> Matthew, no. No, I just made that up. Oh. I like the thought of that, though. They all come to it like, oh, finally, drinking time. Get, gather around, everybody. <laughs> Usually on payday. Let's all go at the surface line. It's gone, mate. I'll get, I'll get you a few drops. <laughs> Fan fancy crisp manufacturers would have to really rethink their lines. Um, one of my big worries about this and got me thinking was back to big mammals. Those poor old whales, they're huge and they're, they're kind of pseudo buoyant. I imagine because of the, the salt content in the sea. So would it be harder for whales to, to surface? They would. Yeah, I think so, yeah. They'd be sad about that. There'd be loads of things that lose their advantage, like, um, what is it, They're, like crocodiles. So we've got these glands on their tongues where they can sweat salt so they can get salt out of their system so they can swim between like salty water and fresh water mm -hmm. and very few things can do that. And I know salmon are really good at coping with the different, going between salty and not salty. So they'd be out of a job and we need to find them new things to do. 
Is this salt going elsewhere or is it just, did it never exist? I'd imagined it, it was probably locked up in rocks, yeah, etc. Okay. Right. okay. Oh, and never got worn away again. Yeah. Just quick aside, you know how we used to crave sugar a lot when we were younger? I still crave sugar a lot now because I haven't really grown up much. Do you guys crave salt now? I yes. describe myself as having a salt tooth. I'm not bothered about your biscuits, your sweets. No, 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 no. Give me like, I, I deliberately order margaritas so I can lick the side of the glass. Fran, I think we are food sisters. <laughs> <laughs> always, always a savoury girl. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I know I will buy posh salt now because I feel like it's important to get mm. those special flakes that you crumble over your food. How do you feel oh. about salted caramel? Oh, yes. Delicious. That is good. Oh, okay, That's right. the meeting of both. I, I have a special crystal salt stick that I use as deodorant. How magic is that? Mm, that is good. Salt That's everywhere. Good. That is good. I was having so a conversation. What? You can buy it in Boots or any other and high street place. Yeah. Fuck. I'm not sure what sort of salt it is, but it's some sort of salt. And I don't smell. I was at dinner with my my work department, who are all scientists also, uh, and we were talking about salt. Maybe it's something I talk about lots these days. And uh, my fellow chemistry teacher was uh, saying that she finds it really funny when her friends have like posh pink Himalayan salt. And she's like, you mean you have impure salt? You have impurities in your salt? Like, yeah, no, no, but it's like this really cool like and at the particular restaurant we were at, they had some black salt. And I was like, that's great. And it sounds really fancy, but it, I mean, it's, just, it's just got some yeah. impurities in that. Are they not healthy minerals though? Are they not like good bits? Because isn't that like what's one of the problems? Like you, if you have refined sugar, you crave loads of sugary foods all the time. And it's the same with salt. So you can eat loads of salty crisps because lots of the good stuff's taken out. Mm. Whereas if you have something that is naturally harvested by the sea... And it has all these special minerals in it, so you're more satisfied by your food. Oh. Who knows? Oh, I take it all back. Give me the impurities. <laughs> I want them now. I feel like a load fewer people would die from uh, dehydration in the world, right, for instance? <laughs> yeah, that would be great. Desert, coastal areas, suddenly you're like, all right, this is all right. Yeah, yeah. We, can, we can deal with this. There'd be plants, there'd be loads of plants all around the coast, right? Oh, it'd be lush. As opposed to just like a couple of specific little bushy type things. Mm. I hate to put it out there, but I think it would probably be an enormous disaster because it, I think James is right and there'd be loads of cool things that would happen, but it'd probably be... Has anyone studied geo, ge, geology? Prop like well. No, but I've heard it rocks. Hey. Ha, ha, ha. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, because so much of... So many things have evolved as... In the ocean, that's that's where we think. That's where we think a lot of life. That's where we think life started. Mm. Um, didn't start in the freshwater lakes. I mean, uh, there's a lot less space there, I suppose, um, and you don't have the hydrothermal vents as often. Um, but yeah, I don't know what well, what would happen if the seas weren't salty. So I I looked this up and found out some things, and uh, yeah, you're right. It would probably be mainly a bit of a disaster. So one of the things that found out was that plankton are very important. And they are these little bloody single cell organisms floating on the top of all the seas and they require minerals and salt to get going and to have a nice life, you know, carry on. Without that, they would die, probably. The reason why they're important is they provide half of the world's oxygen. Bloody hell, Whoa, that's quite no, important. Not true. Half of the world's oxygen, 50%, is produced by phytoplankton. Wow. So that, if they're gone, then we are also going to be starting to be a bit like, <gasps> it's not so much oxygen going around. That would be pretty bad. What, and, and also, when you're talking about uh, crocodiles or whatever else that can adapt to being in fresh water and salt water, as you said, there's only a few species that can do that. Lots can't. So they'd all be gone. Oh. All the salty fish. <laughs> Bye-bye. Can I ask you about, can, uh, when you're reading about the plankton, and the, this, this is like the... Uh, and, did you say cyanobacteria or did I make that up? I, I, made I that, didn't say I that. I made that up. I made that up. No, sorry. I just heard something really cool about the cyanobacteria, like the first photosynthetic things that were making all the oxygen. Apparently, they used to be purple. Because you know how you go into space and you look at the Earth and it's like, whoa, that's green. But it used to be that you'd go into space. I mean, you wouldn't because there weren't humans, but theoretically, something could have gone in space and, and looked at the Earth and thought, whoa, that's, that's purple. Because all the photosynthetic stuff used to be purple back in the day. Why did it change? Ooh, is that because it absorbs? I think it's because of the atmosphere that we have, we get more intense light through in the kind of... Um, so when you, when you take out purple, what colours do you have left? That means that it's absorbing mainly 
Green, green. Yeah. 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 yeah, absorbing mainly green. And I think we have quite a high intensity of green, so that was that was quite efficient. But for some reason, there was this evolutionary change where everything started absorbing red and blue instead. It might just green be because of the production of oxygen and the formation of ozone. Because that pre that uh, the conditions and the radiation was so extreme that like life just was never going to evolve on land. But when you have these cyanobacteria producing oxygen and then later phytoplankton and all of those really cool like early organisms that oxygen provided almost like a safety blanket around the earth um so that might have also changed the wavelengths of light that were transmitting i mean there's more stuff going on to plankton plankton oh wow if they were gone (laughs) they're also a big part of the food chain eaten by krill eaten by whales eaten by loads of things so not only would they not be providing oxygen but they'd also be messing up all the aquatic life. So keep that salt in there, gang. Keep it salty. Keep it salty. Keep it salty, keep it safe. Yeah. Yep. Cool. <laughs> uh, James, what's the question? All stars will end up burning out at some point, according to various theories. Um, this presumably means that there will be a last human at some point. It's a terribly sad thought. But what do we think the last human's thought will be? Insert expletive here, yeah. <laughs> it might be chiller. It's a quiet resignation. Hmm. Just, hmm. So I think, it, I mean, it depends on the circumstances, right? How many other humans around do you think yeah. there will be? Yeah, it can't well, just be none because they'll be the last human. Mm. Yeah, but maybe they're the last human by like, pew, like uh, a split second. Mm. Yeah, it okay. depends how many are the last population. If maybe there's five left at the end, you know, they've gone on a you know a big spaceship somewhere. Is it right, JC, that that's the case? Right, there will all the suns will burn out, and there will be you know when when can we estimate that this will be? Well, different. Oh gosh, well stars are still forming all the time, and different stars end their lives in different ways. So some of them explode and become black holes. Some of them explode again, but become these really dense stars called neutron stars. S- stars like our sun will eventually, instead of being yellow, turn red, get bigger and fluffier, probably burn us all to a crisp anyway, and then go through various different stages. And then until it then sort of burns all its fuel and becomes this white ember called a white dwarf, where it just glows and keeps on glowing with the last bits of flame that it had. So there could be humans elsewhere, right? Could be humans about elsewhere. That. But I mean, yeah, if we're not elsewhere, by my, by my watch, uh, we've got about two billion years before the, star, before the sun engulfs us, is uh, it? Or is it a billion? Ooh. Yeah, so the sun is about, what is it, like 4.5, 4.8 something billion years old, and it's got another, it's about halfway through its life at the moment. Uh, but there are various different things Maybe, that are going to go on. Life crisis? Or? Yeah, <laughs> oh no, what no, am I doing? Oh, I'm still spotty. Ah. Uh, but you've got, you got various other things. We're going to merge into our nearest galaxy, Andromeda, at some point as well. Oh, that's going to be sick. Imagine the night sky, beaut. So how many, I've, I've, I've heard about this before, I think, but I might be wrong. How many, what's the estimated number of collisions of stars and planets and things when we collide with Andromeda? Probably not very many at all. Because Ooh. there's actually a lot of space between all the stars. So our nearest neighbour, it would take if you travelled at the speed of light, it would take you four years to get there. But there might be like loads of new stars forming because gas would be crashing into one another and that when when gas gets nice and dense, then you start forming new stars. I get a bit grumpy when I'm hungry. I'm not sure I'm gonna find this very cool. <laughs> 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 Bam <laughs> Um But the point to focus us back to the question. Do we think it will be on Earth? No. Or do you think we'll manage to travel elsewhere? My mind just went so far away from the question. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot what we were even talking about. I was just focused on the idea that Josie put the words nice and dense together as if those, those always fit together. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when you're talking about cakes, they like definitely nice do. Business, <laughs> right? you, you like things dense. Nice and dense, um, um, big and spacey. <laughs> but yes, uh, so, so, the, so the, sun, the sun's, sun's going to get big and, and engulf us all and that, that'll be bad. Maybe engulf us, okay. Yeah, we don't, because the gravity will start to change because the sun will they'll have this big fluffy envelope, it'll be less dense. So we, no one's actually entirely sure if we would get engulfed or if we might move away a little bit and just miss it. Is it oh, still okay. game over anyway? Like if it gets a bit closer, that's still a bad Probably, thing. Probably, yeah, we'd get, yeah. we'd get pretty sweaty, you know. Uh, okay, cool. Sweaty. But mm. you've got your salt block, so you'll be So I, what, what would the last thought be? You see, I think it depends, yeah, are we going to last this long? And, and will we have spread further away? 
My personal view is probably not, but I'm quite pessimistic about that. Well, we're, we're trying, aren't we? NASA's got a mission called Orion where they're going to try and send some people to Mars. So that's a bit further away. I reckon there'll be something else that will get us before space. Pathogen, zombie apocalypse. There are too many TV shows for it not to come true. <laughs> There's this cool thing that I've been hearing about, about how the Japanese don't have any of these like really negative dystopian things about AI destroying the world. And we do. And so, like, generally over there, they're, they're really embracing AI and they're thinking of it as, like, you know, it's going to create a yeah. beautiful future, whereas over here, everyone's like, whoa, AI, like, what are we going to do about it? It's really scary. If you've read the AI bot authored Harry Potter, then you'll know that AI is not bad. Death Eaters are on top of the castle. Ron bleated, quivering. Ron was going to be spiders. He just was. He wasn't proud of that. But it was going to be hard to not have spiders all over his body after all is said and done. Like <laughs> anything that it's creates something so phenomenal <laughs> has to be good. <laughs> Although I am personally very skeptical about AI. I'm one of those. I'm a, you know, I may as well have a bunker. If I, if I wasn't living in London and therefore the rent was cheaper, I would pay for a bunker or a house with a bunker. Cool. Hey, mummy, who wrote this nice book that I'm reading? <laughs> the Machine. <laughs> <laughs> Why is your voice so deep? <laughs> Um, okay, so yeah, to uh, to try and wrap this up, well, this is a very, <laughs> very open-ended question. But I did, I, I mean, yeah, I was basically just trying to split this into the two categories of we're going to be still on the earth and there'll be some disaster that will kill everyone very, very quickly. In which case, I don't think the thought would be that interesting because you wouldn't necessarily know you were the last person. It'd just be like, oh. Um, it'd be interesting to us, though. <laughs> Maybe it'd be interesting to the external observer, of which there wouldn't exist by definition, because I question James. Um, and uh, yeah, the other one is if there, if it was a slow extinction, which would be really interesting. I don't, I don't know how that how that could happen. Maybe some kind of disease that slowly wipes everyone out. But but I mean, generally, the whole the, the way that we evolve is by adapting to diseases. So a small pocket of the population is almost always immune to, to any given disease. Um, but then you, you do have these animals that slowly go extinct, but it's generally because of destruction of their habitat. Like, um, what's that bird with a really haunting call? The dodo? No, not the no. dodo. The car Maybe. is quite a YY bird or something like that. Anyway, uh, what, that oh, is it a one that does like a boom? No, it's got, it's got, it's got, there, is a, there is a bird that's that done that and I've heard it. That was, that was real haunting. <laughs> there's, a, there's a really sad call um, of this bird that you, that you can hear online. Um, we'll, we'll put the sound in the podcast now. And this is the last call of the last of this species. Um, calling out, calling out to, to no one. That's one of the saddest things I've heard. It is really is, sad. It is really sad. And that, and that could be how humanity ends with someone just calling out, trying to find someone, which would be really sad. But then it was a sad question. So uh, oh, yeah, <laughs> if they knew they were alone, there's like, isn't there a whale that's got its, one of its frequencies wrong or something? Yes. And it tries to speak to the others, but no one can hear it because mm-hmm. it's sending yeah. out the wrong. That's so yeah. sad. But, um, but the, yeah, the, the, other, the other alternative is perhaps that we manage to expand into the universe um, and then it's really open-ended question because if you knew that you were the last person left of a civilization that had managed to expand across planets and yet had somehow reached a stumbling block where every single planet had been wiped out, you'd probably feel pretty responsible and you'd be like, whoa, I really have messed this up. And that would probably then, then be the end. See ya. <laughs> and we have arrived at the end. Thanks to Josie Peters. Goodbye. Frank Grimes. Bye. James Wells. Hello. Matthew Shribman, that's me, and our producer, Sam Lee, and to Unbound for their generous support. Um, you can follow us by searching A Piece of String all across social media or forward slash string podcast. If you'd like to follow me personally, I'm at Josie A. Peters on Twitter and also YouTube. And if you want to follow me, then you can search Science in the Bath or Matthew Shribman on Instagram, Facebook or YouTube or Snapchat. Got a question that people will try and avoid answering for you before coming to some loose conclusion? Please contact us and get in touch. We'd love to hear what you want to ask. You can reach us on any of our social media channels. Just search String Podcast or Piece of String and we'll get back to you or try and include it in our show. Uh, thanks for listening. We'll be back again in a fortnight. And as usual, let's never speak of any of this ever again. <laughs> <laughs>